Hi guys, so this PowerPoint we are going to be covering uh, the pathology related to the abdominal content. So we're going to be talking about some bowel pathology, some um, musculature pathology that we can evaluate on ultrasound. And then we're also going to talk about some pathology and some conditions that are associated with the abdominal aorta and the IVC um, and some of those other uh, vessels as well. So we're going to start off with the vasculature pathology and conditions first. One of the most common things that we are going to see on ultrasound in the vascular world, whether it be in the abdomen or anywhere else in the vascular system, is atherosclerosis. Uh, this is something that you have probably heard of on a commercial before, but it's basically when we have this like excessive amount of fatty material, which is known as plaque, that starts to accumulate within our arteries. Now, we don't usually see atherosclerosis in the veins. This is pretty much isolated to the arteries. Um, and there can be some complications because of that, right? Our, our arterial system is very high pressure system and a lot of this plaque can tend to break loose and travel and get stuck in other parts of the body uh, and cause some problems from that as well. Um, so this is going to not only affect the cardiovascular system but the peripheral vascular circu circulatory system as well. So this is really going to be something that we can see throughout the entire body. Uh, we actually even see this in the arteries in the brain. So really atherosclerosis can affect any artery um, throughout our entire system. Now, as we said, there are some complications that are associated with this. Um, they can cause a thrombus. So the thrombus is when we have the accumulation of blood cells in an area. Atherosclerosis is when we have that accumulation of uh, fatty cells or fatty material. So there are two different types of blockages that can occur in a vessel and particularly in an artery when we're talking about atherosclerosis that can cause an embolus. Um, excuse me, or a thrombus. Now, if we do have a thrombus caused by atherosclerosis or we have just atherosclerosis itself, a little piece of that plaque can break off and travel. And if it travels, if it starts to move, that's when it's now known as an embolus. So if a thrombus, the accumulation of blood cells, or atherosclerosis, the accumulation of fatty cells, starts to move, that is when we term that material an embolus, right? So we're talking about the action of it traveling. Um, atherosclerosis can also cause stenosis or occlusion. Now, stenosis is the narrowing of the vessel. So it's no longer, it's, it's so congested and there's so much plaque accumulated in that artery that the normal blood flow can't travel through as easily as it should, right? So think of a highway. If you have two lanes closed on a three lane highway due to traffic, well, how slow is traffic gonna be moving in that one lane that's open? pretty slow, right? We're not going to get as many cars traveling through because of that blockage from the atherosclerosis. Um, and then also occlusion. Occlusion is when a stenosis gets so bad or a vessel is so blocked that absolutely no blood flow can travel through it. So an occlusion is when they shut down all three lanes on the highway, nothing gets through. Clinically, patients are going to be more susceptible to atherosclerosis if they have a history of smoking, um, if they have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which means that they naturally have more fatty cells um, accumulating in their blood. Um, and then also patients who are diabetics or have uh, poor lifestyles, poor dietary habits are going to be more prone for this. On ultrasound, we are going to be looking in the internal aspect of that vessel, right? So we are looking in the inside lumen of the vessel. We're gonna to start to see some of those irregularities that are commonly gonna to start to occur along the wall of the vessel. We don't just see plaque hanging out in the middle of the lumen, right? That would be like a pedestrian just standing in the middle of the middle lane on a three-way highway. We don't do that, right? A, a person wouldn't do that we more commonly see a pedestrian walking in the breakdown lane, right? So along the wall of the vessel, along the wall of the lumen of that vessel. We're also gonna see some uh, tortuosity, which means that that vessel is starting to kind of change its pathway, right? That vessel is no longer nice and straight um, or nice and curved. It starts to have um, some curls to that pathway. And then we can see some wall calcifications as well. So atherosclerosis can really have a variety of appearances on ultrasound depending on um, the age of the plaque, the severity of the, of the plaque, 
location, and the composition of the plaque as well. So that top left picture, this is um, a picture of a piece of plaque in the aorta. And it's very calcified here, right? We can see it's super hyperechoic and we're getting that shadowing posterior to it. It also looks like it's kind of starting to head into the middle of that lumen of the vessel. So we would be pretty concerned about an embolus in this scenario, right? That plaque breaking off and traveling. Now the picture on the bottom, that picture A, that's showing a nice, clear, distended lumen, right? There's nothing hanging out along the walls of this vessel on either the anterior wall or the posterior wall. But then when we look at the picture on the right side B, we start to see that there's all this plaque hanging out in the vessel. Now you may think that the lumen itself is actually just this thick, but it's not, right? It's really this thick. And we have all of that narrowing, that stenosed part because of this plaque. So we really want to be aware of that wall integrity. Now plaque itself tends to layer on the posterior aspect of the vessel wall. We'll come back to this in the fall, but it's really important for us to think about gravity, right? We spend a lot of our time laying down, a lot of our time sleeping. So as we are laying down and we're laying on our back, that plaque and those fatty cells are going to accumulate along that posterior wall of the vessel. That's just natural in terms of um, gravity for us. So that tends to be a registry question that they like to throw in there. Next, we are going to talk about an aortic aneurysm. So there are several different types of aortic aneurysms, and we'll talk about each of them. There's also something called a pseudo aneurysm, which is kind of like a false aneurysm, but it's still just as important and just as scary. Um, we'll get to that as well. But the uh, any type of aneurysm itself is when we have this abnormal dilation of a segment or of an entire artery, right? So that arteri arterial wall or that artery itself is wider than it should be. And as it gets wider, whether it be in a segment or the entire artery length itself, as it gets wider than it should be, it's causing the vessel walls to stretch, right? And as that stretching is occurring, it's weakening the muscles of that arterial wall and we are more prone to rupture because of that. So we worry about aneurysms quite a bit and we follow them very, very closely. So a triple A stands for an abdominal aortic aneurysm. These are typically going to be located in the aorta underneath where the renal arteries come off, right? So we're gonna see our renal arteries branch off. We know our left branch is slightly distal to where our right branches off. And then that's gonna be the most common spot for a triple A to occur is right underneath where those renal arteries are branching off right before the aorta bifurcates into the common iliac arteries. Now, some common types of um, aneurysms, we have fusiform, we have saccular, we have mycotic, and we have ectatic. Now, there are other types of aneurysms out there as well. There are kind of like these subcategories if you were to take it a step further we don't necessarily need to know all of that information. So a fusiform aneurysm, this is when we have this uniform dilation that kind of extends a particular length of that artery. So it's a little bit more diffuse and it's affecting a little bit more length of that artery, but it's typically less likely to rupture because it's not this focal widening and rapid weakening of that arterial wall muscle. Now, saccular, this is going to be a little bit more concerning. This is when we have this focal outpouching or this very focal dilation in like one small segment of the artery. A mycotic aneurysm is going to be any type of aneurysm that is infectious. So there is inflammation, there's infection, there's all of those other processes associated with an infectious process now also affecting the weakness of that dilated arterial wall. So that's really where we're starting to get 
concerned uh, for a rupture, right? Because not only is the aneurysm causing a weakening of that wall, but now we have an infection that's causing the weakening of the wall even further. And then we have ectatic. This is a, the most diffuse form that we can have of an aneurysm. This is when that dilation occurs for the entire length of that vessel or of that artery. Clinical symptoms, a lot of patients are going to be asymptomatic, uh, but sometimes when they go to their doctor, their doctor is going to hear something abnormal. So they're going to hear what is known as a brewy, and that is when we are listening to any type of arterial pulse, and it sounds like a thrill. Right? It almost sounds like a continuous thrill instead of the very abrupt lump dump of an artery. Right, When you hear that artery, you hear lump dump, lump dump, like the heart contractions. This with the brewery, you hear a little bit more of a consistent type of thrill happening within that vessel. Uh, the patient sometimes, depending on how big these aneurysms are or where they're located, they can have back pain, leg pain, or abdominal pain. And sometimes, depending on how thin our patient is, we can actually see and palpate the aneurysm. So that's always very concerning. On ultrasound, again, it's going to uh, depend on what type of aneurysm, what location, the size of that aneurysm. Is there anything else going on within that artery, right? Is there a thrombus? Is there plaque? Are there calcifications? Are there any wall irregularities? All of those things you want to be interpreting and evaluating when we're looking at an aneurysm. When we are measuring an aneurysm, we are always measuring mainly in transverse. So we have that cross section at the widest part of the dilation of that vessel, and we are measuring an AP, so anterior to posterior, and width in transverse. And then in SAG, we're doing a length if possible. Now, if you have an ectatic aneurysm, we're not really going to be able to get a length in SAG because it's extending the entire length of that vessel, right? But if you have a saccular aneurysm where it's a very focal outpouching, when we elongate that in SAG, we'll be able to see it and provide a length measurement if possible. So let's take a look at what some of these look like. Here we have our fusiform versus our saccular. So you can see that saccular on the bottom. Even the diagram, like this looks pretty worrisome. That looks like if you have a pimple and it's like a whitehead and it's ready to go, like that thing could burst at any second, right? That's kind of the same concept with the saccular aneurysm. It's very sensitive to any type of pressure change um, or any type of like blunt force trauma to the abdomen. Like we really want to make sure that we are, um, you know, treating those patients properly. Whereas fusiform, yeah, we're still dilated, we're still wider than we should be, but we're probably less likely to rupture. That's like a pimple that's kind of just like brewing underneath the surface. Like you can feel it deep in there, but you can't really pop it yet. It's not really making itself visible on the surface, right? So we're going to kind of leave that pimple alone. Um, and you can see here is the fusiform in SAG in the saccular and sag. So we would be able to measure both of these in a length. Next, we have a pseudo aneurysm. So this, anytime we hear the term pseudo, it means false. So this is a type of false aneurysm, although it behaves pretty similarly. When we're talking about a true aneurysm, that is when all three layers of the arterial wall are affected by that dilation. So if we look at that top left diagram, all three of those layers of the artery, the intima, the media, the adventitia, they're all affected by the saccular dilation. When we have something going on with the arterial wall, but it's not all three involved, and it's only a defect in usually the outer arterial wall, the adventitia, that's when we're going to have a pseudo aneurysm, right? So those two inner layers, they're not going to be dilated or outpouched, but we're mainly going to see that outpouching and that defect in that outer um, wall. Now, the defect itself is originating, right? The problem is stemming from some type of disruption in that intima or media layer, but the defect in the outpouching and the dilation is going to occur with that adventitia layer. If that makes sense. Um, so a pseudoaneurysm, this is on ultrasound, I'm going to demonstrate uh, a to and fro 
spectral waveform pattern. So when we put color on a pseudoaneurysm, we are going to see what we call a yin and yang sign, where we're watching the arterial flow in it and then out, and then in it and then out. And we're seeing that color mapping change with that um, arterial pulse into that outpouch. A lot of times pseudoaneurysms are going to have a uh, connecting neck and that is going to connect the pseudoaneurysm to the main arterial lumen. So this itself is the pseudoaneurysm. This is the artery. And this is the neck. These are also really interesting if you um, rotate through a, a vascular or an interventional department, they can actually go in and they can inject with ultrasound guidance right into the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. They inject thrombin and at the same time you compress with the transducer, you put like all of your body weight on that patient's um, body part that we are injecting thrombin in. And as they're injecting that thrombin, you are pushing and compressing that artery so that it closes and then the thrombin keeps it closed. So the thrombin basically clots it off once you've already compressed it. Now it's an artery, so you gotta remember, it takes a lot of pressure to compress an artery. A vein compresses very easily, but an artery does not. So we are pushing and pushing and pushing, and we're putting that thrombin in that area to get it to clot off so that no other blood flow travels through that defect. Next, we have an aortic dissection. So this is a little bit different than an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm. This is when we have a little bit of a tear in the wall of the artery. And when we have that, it's, it's not necessarily a rupture, right? Because we didn't rupture all three layers of the arterial wall. We, we really only had a tear in that inner wall. And when that happens, it allows the blood that's now in the lumen of the vessel to travel between those two layers in the arterial wall. So it kind of like makes its own detour around the rest of the artery. So then we have this blood flow that's traveling through what is known as this false lumen, right? So we have our artery and then we have a little bit of a tear right here. So we get a little oop, cut right in that wall. Now it's going to allow the blood flow to travel through and travel through, right? And there's a little detour that that blood can now travel through on that side of the wall. But what that does is it naturally weakens that portion of the wall, right? So we can rupture from that. So this is really, really important for us to be able to detect on ultrasound, especially if the patient um, has a history of a car accident or any blunt force trauma to the chest or the abdomen. Dissections are most common to occur in the thoracic portion of the aorta, and that's because of blunt force trauma to the chest during car accidents. So whether that be the airbag or the steering wheel, we have that blunt force trauma that causes that tear in the wall of the aorta, and it allows for that blood flow to travel through the layers of the rest of the wall, creating an even greater weakness in that wall. So clinically, these patients are going to have excruciating anterior chest pain that typically will radiate up and down their back. Um, and then again, depending on the cause of this dissection, they could have shock initially, or they can have shock also caused by the dissection, right? Because now we're taking blood supply away from where the aorta was bringing it, and we're, we're keeping it in this detour, right? This other random pathway that we just decided to create in the vessel wall. So the patient can go into shock from that as well. This can also be caused from a cardiac um, catheterization. So if the patient had some type of interventional cardiovascular procedure where we use the arteries as access points, um, you know, and something goes wrong, we can cause that tear in the aorta. Uh, or angiography, again, we're using um, the arteries as access points in this type of interventional radiology. Also, if a patient has hypertension, so you are constantly and chronically, your cardiovascular system is 
just always under high, high pressure. That's going to cause a weakness in the arterial walls, right? So we're gonna get that potential tear from chronic hypertension. Also, if the patient has any type of infectious process, right, mycotic means infectious. So if that aorta is infected, we can have that weakness that creates that tear. And then again, as we said, most commonly severe chest trauma from car vehicle, uh, motor vehicle accidents. Here we have the appearance on ultrasound. So a dissection can very easily be confused for atherosclerosis or lumen irregularities. And what we want to look at to be able to differentiate a dissection from potential plaque is we're looking for a thin membrane, right? We're looking to see that detour or that pathway that occurred from that small tear. So in sagittal, we see this hyperechoic band that extends, right, for a particular portion. And it doesn't really start anywhere and it doesn't really end anywhere. It's just there, right? So if this were plaque, we would see something like this. Right? But we're not seeing those starting points and end points with this. We're just seeing that thin floating membrane. And that's going to be that intimal wall that was torn off of the rest of the walls of the artery. Same thing in transverse. We're going to see that membrane going straight across when we get into the cross uh, access section. We said this is most common in the thoracic aorta, so we want to be aware that if we happen to see this in the abdominal aorta, that we are following that aorta as superiorly as we possibly can. If that means that we have to go and get an echo probe, right, that linear um, sequential array, we need to go get an echo probe, or we need to go have an echo tech come and evaluate that further up into the thoracic cage. We also want to make sure we're following it all the way down as distally as it goes. So you can have this tear extending the entire length of the aorta, right? From the aortic arch at the top of the heart, all the way down to the common iliacs and into the legs. So we want to be evaluating that as long as it is possible. Next, we have an aortic rupture. So these are fairly uncommon. Um, if you have Chelsea in lab, she will be happy to uh, share a story with you guys about how um, one of her patients experienced an aortic rupture. This is fairly uncommon, although it is extremely serious. It has a 50% mortality rate, so only half of the patients with aortic ruptures will survive regardless of medical intervention. These are going to be more likely to occur when we have an aneurysm, right? And if that aneurysm is really big, so greater than six centimeters in any dimension, the uh, um, saccular aneurysms and the mycotic aneurysms are going to be the most common. So again, any type of infectious aneurysm is really going to run the risk of rupturing. And as we know with those sacculars, they're going to be more easily ruptured than a fusiform or an ectatic. Um, these ruptures typically occur in these aneurysms if they're located above the renal arteries. So we just said previously that aneurysms are more common below the renal arteries, but if we happen to have a patient who has an aneurysm above the renal arteries, we need to take that a little bit more seriously and make sure we're following that patient um, as well as we can. These patients are going to have severe abdominal pain, um, and then on ultrasound, we're going to see that large aneurysm, and then we could see some anechoic uh, fluid collections surrounding that aorta. Uh, so in those retroperitoneal spaces, we're going to start to see blood accumulating in those areas. Usually, um, if we're doing an ultrasound at that point, um, it's pretty much worst case scenario. We like to catch these things before they actually rupture. So um, it's not common for us to be performing an actively ruptured aortic exam. That patient's going to the OR. Um, moving on to our gastrointestinal. So um, as for our IVC, we're going to learn more about that in the fall, but really um, the only thing that we need to be concerned about is any type of obstruction or thrombus. And we did speak about thrombuses um, right at the beginning of this PowerPoint. It's that accumulation of blood cells that get stuck in a vessel. Atherosclerosis occurs in our arteries. Thrombus is more likely to occur in our veins. Okay, so you can have 
atherosclerosis that occurs in your veins, but it's not likely. And you can have thrombus that occurs in your artery, but that's also not likely. So thrombus is more common in veins. Atherosclerosis is more common in arteries. Now with the IVC, that's still a vein, so it is still prone to being clot. And if we happen to see a clot in the legs, we want to follow that clot and see if it goes all the way up to our IVC. So that's really the only thing that I would expect you guys to know right now is that if you see a clot in your upper portion of your leg vein, you see a thrombus in the upper portion of your leg vein, you need to go up and check your IVC to see if it's extending up that far as well. The other thing too is the Bud Chieri syndrome. That's the obstruction of the IVC and the hepatics. So as of right now, that's all I expect you guys to know in terms of pathology for the IVC in reference to abdominal vasculature. So moving into our gastrointestinal. So bowel is not our friend. We don't like bowel. Bowel does not like us on ultrasound, but if we are expected to evaluate it, we need to know what it looks like. So normal bowel imaging is known as the gut signature. And this goes in order from the lumen outward. So from the internal portion of the bowel loop out, it goes hyperechoic mucosal layer and then hypoechoic intramural hyperechoic submucosal, hypoechoic muscularis, and hyperechoic serosal. So whatever you need to do, whatever kind of acronym you need to create to get you to remember that, that is exactly what you should do for this information. Normal bowel is compressible. So when we put pressure on it, it should move or it should compress. And we should be uh, visualizing peristalsis. So we should be watching that bowel actively move and transport the material through it while we're scanning. So here in a perfect world, this is what bowel would look like um, that has no gas in that bowel loop. So you can see all of those layers of that um, bowel loop nice and pretty, right? But in reality, this is what we're getting. So we're seeing all of that gas that is stuck inside those layers of the bowel. Okay, so first we have Crohn's disease. So this is not necessarily something that we would be evaluating for on ultrasound, but we do need to be aware of it because a lot of our patients do suffer from this. So this is the manifestation of an inflammatory bowel disease, and it consists of chronic relapsing bouts of inflammation. So basically their gastrointestinal system is just chronically inflamed. And as we know with any vessel that is chronically inflamed, it unfortunately is going to lead to it not functioning properly right? So the ileus or the ilium is the most common uh, location for Crohn's to kind of manifest. So that ilium at the distal portion of our gastrointestinal system is just chronically inflamed for these patients. Some complications from this because it's intestine that's chronically inflamed, right? It's not going to work as well as it should. We could have bowel perforation because that bowel is very weak due to that inflammation. We could have abscess formation. We could have ulcers forming. We could have fistulas forming. So we really need to be aware of the severity of Crohn's disease um, in our patients. Clinically, the patients will have pain. They'll have abdominal pain, fever, because again, their body's in a constant inflammatory state. They're going to have weight loss and diarrhea because their gastrointestinal system is not working properly. And also because they probably fear eating. On ultrasound, if we are expected to look at a particular region of the gastrointestinal system or they want us to look at the ileum, we want to be aware of what is normal versus not normal. So if we see a non-compressible, hypervascular, uh, hyperechoic, thickened bowel wall, um, that's going to indicate to us that there's something abnormal happening. So if we look at this picture here, any bowel loop that we have scanned in lab, you know, does not look like this, right? So, um, you know, this is pretty thickened, especially at the ileum. It is, um, you know, showing some edema around it, right? Some inflamed tissue. And this is showing that it's not compressible. So this measurement right there is showing that that is still thickened even under compression. 
Next, we have appendicitis. So this is something that is um, very common for us to see if we were working in the PD department, but if we're working in a general department, chances are we're not doing appendicitis on ultrasound. Usually those patients will go right to CT. Uh, but if this is a PD patient, this is something that we need to be aware of. This is the inflammation of the appendix portion of the gastrointestinal system, usually caused by some type of obstruction in that region. Uh, complications, as we know, appendicitis can rupture, um, and abscess formation can occur and result to that. These patients will have right lower quadrant pain. It's important to mention that most patients, the appendix is located on the right side, but some patients it can be located on the left side. So we don't want to dismiss any left lower quadrant pain. Patients will also have fever, again, inflammatory process, and rebound tenderness. So with rebound tenderness, it's a little bit different than the Murphy's sign, but, the, but similar in concept. Rebound tenderness, when you have a Murphy sign and you are putting pressure on the area of the gallbladder, the patient has pain when you push. When you have appendicitis and you have rebound tenderness, the patient has pain after you release from pushing. So if you push on the right lower quadrant on the appendix, they're not going to have horrible pain. Their pain is going to occur when you let go that transducer pressure. That's rebound tenderness. On ultrasound in the region of the right lower quadrant, we're gonna see a target pattern uh, type of bowel loop. You need to be aware of what is actually the appendix. The appendix is a blind ended structure. So that means the appendix does not extend into anything else. If we see the appendix and we elongate on it and it continues to travel, it's not the appendix. Okay, so we'll see that on our next slide. Um, but anything typically greater than six millimeters in diameter is going to be uh, indicative of, of appendicitis. Um, that's going to be uh, showing us that it's thickened. We could see some fluid surrounding the end of the appendix. We could see an abscess forming, and we could see an appendicolith or a fecalith, and that's just like a little isolated area of inflamed appendix tissue or inflamed fecal tissue surrounding where that appendix is and where it ends. So here we have two examples showing the blind end of the appendix, right? So here, we're ending here. That is not elongated or elongating into any other segment of the gastrointestinal system. So that in fact is the end of our appendix. We know we're in the region of the appendix. Same thing on this side, except we're going in the opposite direction. That is the end of our appendix. And we also have some free fluid kind of hanging out. So it's making our job even easier to find it if there is free fluid. Usually if the appendix is normal, we're not gonna see it. So if we see it, chances are most likely abnormal. So we wanna be looking for all of those other indications and signs to say that, hey, wait a minute, I shouldn't be seeing this. So I need to know that that's abnormal. Um, and then picture on the left side, uh, we're not getting an actual caliper measurement, but that's clearly going to be greater than six millimeters. Um, and of course we're seeing it, so we know that it's abnormally thick. Next we have ischemic bowel disease. This is when our uh, intestines do not get enough arterial blood supply and it results in that tissue dying, the bowel tissue dying. Um, so it's a rough situation to be in when your bowel just literally starts to die off because it doesn't have blood supply. This is a very urgent condition and we treat this with blood thinners uh, and vasodilators. So we widen the vessels that supply the bowel to make sure that as much blood flow can get through as possible. Clinically, these patients are going to have abdominal pain and weight loss. They'll also have postprandial pain. So that means that they're going to have very severe abdominal pain after they eat. On ultrasound, we are going to see hypovascular bowel, right? Because if we put color on the bowel and we don't see any blood flow, well, then we have to say, is it getting any blood, th blood flow to it? What's going on with those vessels that should be supplying that bowel? Uh, we're also going to see wall thickening of the bowel. And then in the adjacent nearby arteries, we could see an occlusion or a stenosis. So that's really taking our job a step further. We probably wouldn't be able to evaluate that on general ultrasound. Um, but if we happen to see a vessel near the bowel, we put color on it, doesn't light up, or it shows a really tight stenosis, then we need to question if it's going to be affecting the blood supply to the nearby bowel. 
So here we have our bowel. Our bottom two pictures are um, us putting color on. We're even using color power Doppler, so we're really trying to pick up any type of blood flow um, in this bowel, and it's clear that we're not. Even over here, here's our adjacent aorta. We're not getting any blood flow to that bowel. Um, and you can see it's very thickened. It's uh, you know, very abnormal looking in comparison to the bowel that we're used to seeing. Next, we have adenocarcinoma. And you're like, wait a minute, I just did this. I just put this in my, in my pathology chart. I just did it. It's something that we can see in any type of organ that has functional tissue, right? So just like we can have an adenoma that happens in any type of functional tissue, well, guess what? We can have the same type of tumor formation but it's malignant. So we can have adenocarcinoma um, located all throughout the abdominal system and the gastrointestinal system. It's going to be a malignant uh, primary source of cancer that's originating from glandular tissue. So in this case, we're talking about gastrointestinal tissue. We're talking about bowel tissue. So the most common location for this to occur is going to be in the colon, the rectum, and the rectosigmoid portions of the uh, GI tract. Clinically, the patient can be asymptomatic. Uh, it can result in bowel obstruction, of course, because it's a tumor growing in the bowel. Um, the patient can have anemia from it. So they can have changes in bowel habits, either too often or not enough. The patient's going to have weight loss on ultrasound, it's going to appear as an actual mass within the bowel. So we wanna make sure that, hey, if we see a mass hanging out in the abdomen, is it an abdominal mass or is it a gastrointestinal mass? Is it sitting within a bowel loop? Is it in the gastrointestinal system or is it a retroperitoneal tumor? Or is it an exophytic ovarian tumor? Is it at an adnexal tumor from the pelvis? So we really need to be sure of where it is originating, especially if we're questioning it being part of the gastrointestinal system. Because as we know, like it's really hard to prove that something is normal or abnormal with the bowel. So in this case, we really need to be aware of where it's positioned and what it is um, in relationship to. So here we have an example of adenocarcinoma. Now, picture on the left side, you're probably thinking like, well, that's probably just like a bowel loop with some gas in it, right? But this should draw your attention. And you should say, well, wait a minute, what the heck is that? Is that like some of my spleen coming in? Like, what is that? That entire thing is the adenocarcinoma sitting in a loop of bowel. Now, you're probably saying, well, where's the loop of bowel? And if you look at the picture on the right side, this whole thing is a bowel loop, right? So here is the abnormal appearance of that bowel loop, but look at the effect that it's having on the rest of the bowel loop. Moving on to our gastrointestinal obstructions. So these are not really any um, malignancies, but these are pretty problematic situations that our patients can be in. So our first type of obstruction is, in a, is a mechanical obstruction, and this is any type of physical blockage of the bowel, either partial or complete, meaning either some material can still get through the obstruction or absolutely nothing can get through because of this physical blockage that's occurring at some segment. The patient's going to have abdominal pain and um, distension as well as vomiting. And if you think about, well, why would they be vomiting? Nothing else can get through, right? If they have a complete mechanical obstruction, nothing can get through. So anything they eat has to come out. And if it can't come out one end, it's got to come out the other end, right? On ultrasound, we're going to see severely dilated bowel loops due to all of that backup and all of that pressure. We're going to see hyperperistalsis, and that means that the bowel is peristalsing way more than it should be because it's trying so hard to get everything to move through, even though it can't. Um, and then we're going to see diameter alterations of the affected dilated bowel. So, of course, that bowel is going to be very dilated. Here on x-ray is um, quite an obvious progression of different mechanical obstructions. Now picture on the left-hand side, this is a totally normal abdomen, right? 
we see some vowel loops. If you look very closely, we see some, a vowel loop here. All right, we see all this vowel loop over here. Oh, we got some gas in this vowel loop over here. And then we got more vowel loops going down into the pelvis there. Right, but everything looks like pretty smooth sailing. This right here, it's black right here because that's air in the stomach. So that's kind of the proximal part of our abdominal system or our gastrointestinal system. You know, this picture in the middle, we're like, hmm, what's going on, right? Like, why is this very prominent right here? There's an obstruction right here. There's some type of blockage right there that's causing this backup at that level. Now this picture on the right hand side, woof, like that must be extremely, extremely uncomfortable. This is showing dilated bowel loops throughout the entire length of this person's gastrointestinal system, all the way back up to their stomach. So this means that there's a very distal obstruction. There is some obstruction happening right at that rectal region that for some reason just cannot get the material to move through. So it is totally backed up the entire length of this patient's system. So what an unfortunate situation. Um, next, we have a paralytic ileus. So this is actually, um, it's still considered a type of, of an obstruction, but it's not necessarily something that's like blocking the system, right? This is the actual paralysis of the musculature happening inside the bowel loops, inside the intestines. So our normal intestines, they have like this natural uh, muscular movement and contractions that move everything through the way that they should. But then when we have a paralysis of that musculature, nothing is going to happen, right? It's not naturally moving anything through it anymore. So it is technically a type of obstruction. Clinically, the patient will have changes in bowel habits, distension, and pain. On ultrasound, we're going to, again, see dilated bowel loops. We are going to see a peristalsis in this scenario. So Unlike the mechanical obstruction where peristalsis is happening in overdrive to try to get all that stuff out, this is the actual paralysis of those muscles that cause peristalsis, right? So if those muscles that are responsible for peristalsing everything through are paralyzed, we're not going to have peristalsis, right? Uh, and then we also can see some fluid filled, uh, fluid, fluid levels in the loop. So that is what we are looking at on this picture here. So here we have that x-ray. The, the majority of where we're looking is right up here in the stomach region. And we see this very sharp line here, very sharp line here, another sharp line here. And this is because the patient is standing. So because of gravity, it's pulling this fluid down, pulling that fluid down, pulling this fluid down. So we're picking up those fluid levels in the bowel. It's a pretty interesting uh, x-ray concept. Next, we have intussusception. So this is something that is very common in pediatric patients and very uh, young infant patients because their gastrointestinal system is just trying to figure itself out. And what this is, is the telescoping of one bowel segment into the next bowel segment. So if you look at our diagram on the top there, you can see like instead of a normal pathway, this section of the bowel got sucked into this section of the bowel. If you ever had one of those like jelly roll toys where it never, like it was just folded in on itself. I, I don't know if I'll try to find a picture of it, but they were like this old toy that was filled with like this like sparkly gel on the inside and you could just roll it and it was always just telescoped on itself. That's exactly what this is with the deception. Clinically, the patient is going to have pain, distension, vomiting. Um, they could even have bloody or um, mucousy stool on ultrasound, we are going to see a target pattern, but we're also going to see what's known as a pseudo kidney appearance. And that is the appearance of those multiple hyperechoic versus hypoechoic layers of the bowel telescoped on itself, right? So we just talked about that gut signature, hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo. Now you're doing that times two because your bowel loop is in another bowel loop right? So you're going to see that double fold, and that's what gives us that pseudo kidney appearance. So if we look at our bottom picture here, you're probably thinking, oh, that's like a nice, pretty transverse kidney. It's not. That's intussusception of that bowel segment. 
Next we have volvulus. So this is when our bowel actually twists on itself. So intussusception is it telescopes into the next segment. Volvulus is when it twists on itself and it cuts off its own blood supply. Clinically, the patient will have pain and vomiting on ultrasound, still looking at dilated bowel loops. And then we also can see a whirlpool sign when we put color on or swirling appearance of uh, blood flow in that region. Now, we're not going to see blood flow here because that's where it's actually cutting it off. So we're going to see it kind of like reacting here where the fecal matter can't get through and the blood flow kind of doesn't know what to do because it's, it's stopped on one end. So um, volvulus is a little bit more of a abstract ultrasound concept. Next we have pyloric stenosis, also known as hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Again, another very common pediatric uh, condition, very early infantile condition. This is when the pyloric segment of the stomach is thickened. So we have our esophagus that goes into like the fundus of the stomach. And then as all that material gets ready to head into our bowels or our intestine, it travels through the pyloric region of the stomach into the duodenum, right? So if our pylorus, if the muscle in that area is enlarged or thickened, it's going to make that pathway way more narrow, right? So all the contents from the stomach can't get through that really narrow stenosed pathway because that muscle's too thick. So the patient is going to have projectile vomiting. So this is not normal baby spit up. This is the mom tries to feed the baby and everything just comes like profusely flying back out. This isn't a little spit up. This is projectile. These babies also have failure to thrive. So when you have a baby, it's very important in the first few days and few weeks to make sure that that baby exceeds weight markers. Um, and if they don't, they consider them failure to thrive. And this is one of the things that they want to rule out. Is the baby eating? If they are eating, are they projectile vomiting? What is happening with their weight gain or their weight loss? So we need to be aware of that, especially in those first few days of life. If we do happen to evaluate for this, we're going to see an elongated canal connecting the stomach into the duodenum on the baby. We're gonna see a thickened muscular portion of that wall. Um, and we're gonna see non-visualization of the stomach emptying into the duodenum. So this exam uh, has a very particular requirements in terms of how we perform it. So this is really only going to be done in a pediatric department, usually under the supervision of a radiologist. And you will have the patient come in um, in a fasting state and you will ask the mom, you'll be scanning this region, and you'll ask the mom to give the baby some food. If the baby can get that food down without the projectile vomiting, it's going to fill the stomach, right? So in this picture here, we have a filled stomach. We have a filled stomach the filled stomach. Now we expect as we're live scanning and we're watching that fluid in the stomach, we expect to watch it go into the canal, into the duodenum, right? But all of these are representing that thickened pyloric muscle of the stomach. So if you look, is there any pathway for that fluid to travel through any of those three pictures that I just drew on? No, right? Maybe a little bit here, but not enough to keep that baby alive and healthy and well. So we need to go in and surgically repair that. Now this picture on the top left side, this is where I'm showing you the normal appearance of the duodenum that we're used to seeing, right? You guys question this as the gallbladder a lot, right? Or the main portal vein a lot. So we need to be aware of where that duodenum usually sits in the typical appearance of it. So that if we do happen to see this kind of elongated, thickened portion in that region of the duodenum, we could say, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on with this baby? Are they eating enough, right? Is there a stenosis in that region because of that thickened muscle? Next, we have a hernia. So this is something, this is like the bane of every ultrasound text existence because they're just kind of like very hard for us to evaluate and diagnose. And a lot of 
physicians like to just clinically assume that a problem with their patient is just a hernia. So they make our job a little bit harder, but it's the protrusion of fat or bowel through an opening in the uh, ventral portion of our abdominal wall muscles where no muscle is present. So when you think of somebody who has a six pack, right? You have those bulging muscles, but down the middle, you have that, that line, right? And in between those six packs, you have those horizontal lines. In those regions, we don't have muscle covering that area. It's usually just the ligament or um, a tendon in that region, right? So in a region where there is no abdominal anterior wall muscle, we can get this protrusion of material. This can either be acquired or congenital. So you can have this um, just as you develop, or you can get this from trauma, overexertion. We see this a lot in bodybuilders. They're just overusing and they're putting way too much tension on those abdominal muscles that it creates a weakening and a separation of the abdominal muscle from the wall. So it allows that protrusion to come through um, in pregnancy as well. Of course, as our belly grows, it separates and spreads those muscles um, in our anterior abdomen. Now you can have a strangulated hernia, and this is when you have that protrusion of material through that defect, and then it actually starts to cut off its blood supply. Um, so if you have a strangulated hernia, you really need some medical attention because you can lose bowel if bowel is what's protruding through. You can have tissue death because of that. And then we can also have incarcerated. So this is when we have a protrusion that cannot return to the normal position. So if you know anyone who has a hernia, chances are they can make it pop in and pop out. If they can't make it pop back in, then it's gonna be incarcerated, right? So just think of like, if you're in prison, you're incarcerated, you're stuck there, right? You're not getting back into the real world for quite some time, right? So incarcerated, it is just chronically an outward protrusion that does not return back to its normal position. Strangulated means it has no blood supply and it's cutting off uh, those tissues and bowels. On uh, ultrasound, we are looking to evaluate the defect where this has occurred. So we're looking at the fascia of the abdominal musculature. And we also want to be performing valsalva movements to see if when we have that patient put pressure in their abdomen, if they can get it to protrude outward. Uh, patient's going to have tenderness, difficulty with bowel habits, um, and we could see a visible protrusion or even a persistent protrusion if it's an incarcerated one. So here on the left side, this is our diagram. So normally we would want this to be nice and intact, but clearly there's some type of defect there where the muscle is not functioning properly. So it's allowing for that bowel to protrude through. If we look at our picture in the middle, here is our normal six pack on one side, joining with the other six pack on the other side. Here's that midline that doesn't really do anything on the bodybuilder, but we can still see it. It's still nice and in contact. That's a, um, tendon and they're holding it together. Now, when we have that six pack on that side, oh, and it's starting to separate from the six pack on the other side. Now we have this defect here. We have the separation and this is our hernia. So see how discreet that is. And when you don't have it side by side with the comparison of what's normal and what's abnormal, it's really hard as a sonographer to figure out, is that just my patient or is that really a defect, right? I mean, the defect is pretty obvious to see, but the hernia itself, not really, not so much, right? And then the picture on the right-hand side, so again, here's that abdominal wall, here's our defect, and this is our entire hernia. Next, we have a rectus rectus sheath hematoma. This is very common after a patient has a C-section. It is a focal collection of blood within the rectus sheath. We usually uh, get this from trauma or surgery and the most common surgery that happens across the rectus sheath of our abdomen is a C-section. So we see these a lot in new moms. Clinically, the patient will have pain, palpable mass, decreased hematocrit. Remember, anytime we're talking about lower levels of hematocrit, we are questioning a bleed somewhere, right? On ultrasound, it's going to appear as a focal mass with variable echogenicity. If it's an early bleed and it's just starting to accumulate, it's going to be anechoic. And as it gets older, it's going to become more echogenic. So here you can see this sitting within that muscle layer, right? Here's our muscle, 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 muscle. 
moving in to some of our more um, kind of random abdominal findings. First, we have a desmoid. This is very rare. I don't think I've ever even seen an abdominal desmoid, but this is a benign encapsulated fibrous tumor. So it's made up of fibrous tissue. Uh, a lot of our abdominal uh, supportive structures are made up of fibrous tissue. So it's originating from those um, kind of skeletal structures and connective tissues and supportive tissues and cartilage and so on and so forth. Um, it's going to arise from the muscle sheath of the abdominal wall and the connective structures, as we said, clinically the patient will have a palpable mass because it usually is sitting pretty superficial on the patient. On ultrasound, we'll see that focal mass and it will have variable echogenicity depending on really the structures that it's made up of, right? So we said it's a fibrous tumor, but it can, it can have uh, muscle cells in it. It can have fatty cells in it, um, right? Because it can come from the connective tissues or the muscle sheath. So it's going to have variable echogenicity. And similar to that rectus sheath hematoma, this is going to be located still within that kind of uh, soft tissue layer, right? So here we are in that fatty layer of the patient's abdomen. This would be more so our musculature, our muscle layer. So here we have skin, fatty layer, and then our musculature. Not the greatest examples of the muscle layers, but you can kind of see that posterior border of the um, subcutaneous layer. Next, we have ascites. We've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, it's the excessive accumulation of serous fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Patients going to have stension, pain, shortness of breath because their diaphragm doesn't have as much space to move down into the abdomen when they take a big breath in. Um, liver failure, if it's caused by cirrhosis. It's important to know that there are different types of ascites in terms of the registry. In clinical, ascites is pretty much just ascites, right? We don't tend to worry about it too much. Um, but for the registry, you do need to know that there's transudative, exudative, and loculated types of ascites. So transudative is when we have really high levels of serum albumin. The fluid is going to appear nice and anechoic. We're going to see free floating bowel. The fluid is going to conform to the surrounding structures and it's going to kind of move and groove and change with the patient if the patient is moving around. So that's nice and benign kind of minding its own business type of ascites. Exudative is a response to a malignancy or an inflammation. And this is when our bowel starts to get affected by this fluid. So it starts to become matted down in the peritoneal cavity, meaning it's a little bit more attached to the peritoneal wall. Uh, it's gonna be thickened fluid, echogenic debris. It could have some septations in it. Now we're going to talk about malignant ascites in a minute, and this is not that. This is not malignant ascites. This is ascites in response to a malignancy or an inflammation. And then we can also have loculated. So this is when the fluid does not conform to the surrounding structures and it doesn't change the patient position. So that's a little bit harder for us to drain, to evaluate, to kind of figure out what's going on. It's kind of just like these little pockets of ascites that are just minding their own business in the patient's abdomen, but they're not like they're not like in a working relationship with the rest of the peritoneal cavity. So here we have our ascites. At this point, we should probably all know what this looks like. Nice free floating bowel. This picture here. Peristentesis. We know that we want to be imaging all four quadrants. We know that this is a sterile procedure. We're treating this as such. Um, we can either have therapeutic or diagnostic, meaning we can send it out for lab results if it's therapeutic, or if we're just trying to give the patient some relief, we don't do anything with the fluid. We just discard it. Um, sorry, and that is therapeutic. Diagnostic is when we send it out to get information. We're imaging all four quadrants. We want to be poking the largest and the safest pocket possible away from any vessels, away from any bowel. Uh, patient is going to be scanned semi-upright. We're allowing gravity to help us, right? So we're allowing gravity to pull all of that fluid down to the um, lower parts of the pelvis so that it can drain much more easily. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are caring for our patient during this entire process. This can take a while for some patients. 
Next, we have malignant ascites. So this is pseudomyxoma peritonite. This is where we actually have metastatic spread through this fluid. So the fluid itself has the malignant cells in it, the malignant tumor cells. And as that fluid reaches the different parts of the peritoneal cavity and it reaches the different organs in the peritoneal cavity and it attaches to those organs, that's how it spreads. So it's very, very intense and aggressive. We also can get these tumor implants on the peritoneal surface itself. So although the tumor cells are traveling through this fluid, they can also start to form actual tumors in other regions of the peritoneal cavity. Um, so this is a high association with appendix malignancy. So um, bizarrely enough, our appendix can have a malignancy associated with it. Appendix cancer very strange. I've never um, seen that before, but it does have a high association with that. So you can see that it's, it's pretty rare, right? Because we're not even talking about uh, a cancerous process associated with the appendix. Uh, on ultrasound, this is not going to be our normal, pretty anechoic ascites with free floating bowel. This is going to be nasty, junky stuff. This is going to be complex ascites. We are going to see echogenic foci within that fluid. We are going to see it starting to affect the surfaces of the liver and the spleen, right? Because now that's going to be the first region that this malignant fluid can touch from the peritoneal cavity. So it's going to kind of like eat away the liver and the spleen from the outside in. So that border of the spleen and the liver are going to become scalloped because of its direct communication with this malignant ascites. So next we are going to talk about some abdominal fluid collections, abscess, we all know what this is. Lymphocele, this is when we have a collection of lymph fluid outside of a typical lymph lymphatic channel. Um, these aren't very common for us to see, but we can sometimes see these uh, post-surgically. A seroma, this is also very common after a surgery. This is a collection of serous fluid, different than a cyst, right? So this is a, um, collection of serous fluid, whereas a cyst is more in an actual organ itself. A seroma can occur in just the free space of the peritoneal cavity or the retroperitoneal cavity. A bioma is a collection of bile outside of the gallbladder. So we would never really be able to tell the difference between a lymphocele seroma or biloma unless we were actually sampling that fluid. Um, and these are all going to have varying ultrasound appearances due to the fluid content, age, and location, um, and of course, different clinical presentations due to the cause and duration. Next, we have some retroperitoneal tumors, and it's important to understand the uh, word breakdown of these. When we have a malignant retroperitoneal tumor, it's going to end in a sarcoma. The benign version of that will just be the root of that word. So when you have a lipoma, that's a benign tumor made of fat. When you have a liposarcoma, you have that same thing, but it's a malignancy arising from fat. So benign, you have a leomyoma. This is um, composed of smooth muscle cells. Rhabdomyoma is composed of striated muscle cells. Fibroma is from connective tissue. And then the malignant counterparts of that. Next, we have adenopathy and lymphadenopathy. So we kind of talked about this last week uh, a little bit with our lymphatic PowerPoint. This is the um, visualization of lymph nodes or the enlargement of lymph nodes if we're talking about uh, adenopathy, right? So lymphadenopathy, when we have that apathy, that is saying that there's something abnormal going on with that lymph node. Um, so it's usually the enlargement caused by an inflammatory process, tumor, or met metastatic spread. We can see these lymph nodes accumulate in regions other than the neck, axilla, and groin, right? So we can see lymph nodes enlarged in the abdomen, but they're pretty, pretty worrisome if that's the case. Uh, we can see these around the aorta, near the mesenteric and the celiac arteries, in the hypogastric region, uh, when we're talking about our abdominal segments. And then we can see these intraperitoneal near the splenic hilum, near the pancreatic head, and near the hepatic hilum as well. On ultrasound, the patient could be asymptomatic. They could have a palpable mass in a particular area, or they could also have fever, elevated white blood cell count, um, so they really can have a variety of clinical appearances depending on the cause of why these lymph nodes are enlarged. Now, usually 
it would be less worrisome if our patient has a fever and elevated white blood cell count because that tells us that they're fighting something off. They're fighting off some type of infection and that's better than there being a malignancy, right? So we kind of want to see that response if we're ruling them out as more likely to be benign. On ultrasound, we are going to see these um, in those particular regions. We don't see these super large in the abdomen. Right? We said that these lymph nodes can get really big in the neck, the axilla, the groin, and that's totally fine in those regions. It's not totally fine when we see them that big in the abdomen. So we want to see these less than a centimeter in size. If we see them, and if we see them greater than a centimeter in size, we need to question them. We also want to see them have nice hyalur vascularity. We want to see them be homogeneous, medium level echogenicity. And then we can see some potential displacement or compression of vessels surrounding these, this lymph node, depending on where it's located. If we have a lymph node that's located near the pancreatic head, well, we know that there's so many vessels that travel in that region. And same thing with the hepatic hilum. If we have a large lymph node there, it's going to start to compress and displace those vessels that are surrounding it. So again, we need to work that up and figure out why those lymph nodes are doing that. So here we have our um, two two examples of lymph nodes still in that parapancreatic region. Here we have our liver and here we have our pancreatic head. Now, I don't remember this case study particularly, but I don't, I'm not 100% sure if this is an additional lymph node, but here we can see that this is a pretty good size lymph node. Uh, same thing with this picture on the right side. Again, we have one here and we have another one here. Now, these don't have that normal appearance that we talked about last week right, the hypoechoic cortex with the hyperechoic central portion, these appear more solid-like. Now, if we saw lymph nodes that looked like this in a patient's axilla, even though they're small, we would question them being malignant. But because these are intra-abdominal, we're not worried about these as much because we don't see that cortex and we don't see that inner central portion. We are mainly looking at the size when we're looking at an intra-abdominal lymph node. And next we have lymphoma, just finishing up here with our lymphoma and our metastatic spread. Um, lymphoma, the primary neoplasm of lymphoid tissue. So this is going to come from any lymphatic structure. Uh, this is very closely related with metastatic spread to the gastrointestinal tract. So if a patient has a history of lymphoma, regardless of the type that it is, we really want to be able to get that patient the proper evaluation of their GI system. Clinically, it's going to depend on the location of the lymphoma, the spread of the lymphoma, if it is affecting the GI system. If it is, where is it affecting it? The patient could potentially be asymptomatic. They could get a bowel obstruction depending on where that lymphoma is spreading to. Um, patient could have weight loss. On ultrasound, if we are evaluating a particular segment of that bowel in a patient who has lymphoma, we are seeing it thicken, we're seeing hypoechoic bowel, possible mass in that region, and a target-like pattern to the bowel loop. And then our metastatic spread. So as we know, spread of malignant cells from a primary site to another region. Clinically, again, really depending on, on the patient's situation. Where is that primary located? Where are we questioning that it's affecting, right? Patient, again, could have bowel obstruction if it is affecting the bowel, weight loss, and same thing, thickened bowel, uh, potential focal mass as well. So lots of information on this, a lot of information that we probably won't see too often in clinical, um, a lot of PD conditions that we need to be aware of as well. So any questions, please feel free to reach out.